Center. And of course, you'll want to be part of that. If you've not yet received a prayer card uh, out on the table after the service this morning, he'll be there and encourage you to go by the table, ask questions, get to know him, uh, get a prayer card, do all that. And uh, we would love to uh, love to understand how we can help this ministry there. This morning, I'm going to ask you to take your Bible to Jonah chapter number two, Jonah in chapter two. Let's have kids uh, dismiss out for junior church at this time. As they head next door, everybody else here, Jonah, chapter number two. After I read the scripture this morning, uh, Brother and Mrs. Fry will come and they'll sing for us. And uh, in English, let's, let's keep, no, uh, you, can, you can mix into some Chinese, that'd be all right as well. That'd be fine. That's fine. Uh, but they'll, they'll come and sing and we'll enjoy that after the, the scripture reading this morning. Jonah, chapter two, if you were here last Sunday... We began with Jonah chapter 1, and through this month, I'll be preaching through the book of Jonah, and I uh, hope you can, can be here each Sunday and uh, be part of that as we learn from this great book here in God's Word. Last week, we saw Jonah, who was a prophet of God, called to go do something, yet Jonah had other plans. God told him to go this way. He went that way. And of course, we saw the tragedy from God last week. Uh, we, we can kind of title that the prodigal prophet running from God. This week, we're in chapter number two, and we're going to see the idea of a praying prophet returning to God. And uh, let's look at Jonah chapter two. I'd like to read together the first uh, several verses. We, uh, let, let's plan to read the whole chapter here, just 10 verses. And if you're able, could you stand with me, please, for the reading of God's word? And we'll read every other verse loud. I'll begin with the Eve, or with the odd-numbered verse. Start with verse 1. I'll ask everybody, would you join me on verse 2, reading that out loud? We'll come through the chapter that way, reading responsibly. Jonah, in chapter number 2, let's look at verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried, For thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the sea, about all thy billows and the waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. <laughs> the waters can pass me about, even to the The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee in thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake thy O mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish upon the dry land. Here we see a prayer coming from Jonah. Nine verses of a prayer, one verse of God's response. And we're going to take this chapter today and uh, look at the idea of returning to God, or we could put it this way, getting right with God. I'm going to pray. The fries will come and sing for us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. pray that you'd help us to receive it with gladness today. May we understand it Lord, may we apply it to our lives. May we walk out of here closer to you than when we came in. And God, should you tarry your coming, I pray that we would understand how we could draw closer to you day by day. And Lord, should we ever stray, how we could return and understand the need to be close to you, our Savior. Thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for what we've done already in our midst. Bless now all that takes place in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea, billows roll, whatever my lot, 
Thou hast taught me to say, It is well, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. With my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. Yoshi my sin, oh, the bliss of His glory has thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross. And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul and Lord. Praise the day when my face shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. Praise the Lord as we hear that song. And again, I hope you get to know the Fry family a little bit better. And please, please, please come back tonight, 6 o'clock. That'll be a blessing. We're in Jonah chapter number 2. Again, last week, the idea of Jonah running from the presence of God and uh, doing his own thing. We saw the cycle of how God starts with a calling and then uh, we, we uh, confliction and confrontation and ultimately God's judgment came to Jonah and uh, he was cast into the sea. Remember how the, the mariners on board the ship there uh, being destroyed because of the storm. They, they threw Jonah overboard and immediately the storm stopped. Now we pick up the scene and Jonah is swallowed by a great fish. We read in Chapter 1, verse number 17, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. It was in these days and nights, Jonah began to change a little bit. And you can imagine that, couldn't you? Uh, the transformation that took place inside the fish's belly. Now, I'm not just talking a physical change, but Jonah changed in his heart. And Jonah changed on the inside. And how many of us have ever been uh, put in a position that God did something and, and we, we can truly say God was chastening us, God was judging, God was trying to get our attention, and all of a sudden we could say, I've been in the fish's belly, I know what it is to have God working on my heart. I know what it is to have God chastening me. I know what it is to have God dealing with me. And Jonah responded in kind and began to get things right. I asked the question this morning, how close are you to God? How close are you? Has there ever been a time in your life when you've had a better standing with God than what you have right now? I dare say the fact you're in church this morning and uh, judging by, by just the, the countenance of your face and, and people here, I, I think you want to be here. I think you truly love the Lord. I think you came on purpose. I think you're, you're here because uh, God's good to you and you, you want to come and rejoice in him and worship him. I think that's why you're here. But perhaps, like myself, I, I've been in church 
many, many times and many, many years. Uh, I know what it is to walk in these doors and even come up to a pulpit and preach his word, knowing that, boy, I'm not quite as close as I was maybe last week or last month. Or I can remember back a year ago when I was so close to God. But how about today? My question is, are you as close as you've ever been? And maybe the answer comes around and you have to think, Mo, not as close as ever, but hey, I'm not, not as far as I've ever been. Praise God for that. But if we're not as close as we've ever been before, ask this question, who moved? If I get close to God, the Bible says in James, uh, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. But that verse doesn't work in reverse. If I get away from God, God does not get away from me. You see, as I draw nigh, he draws nigh to me. But if I leave, I leave alone. And God stays right there. I ask this question today, as Jonah realized in his own life, he had to return. He had to get right with the Lord. You'll never fulfill what God has called us to do until we are completely right with him. Getting right with God often involves a returning to God. It was Jacob back in the book of Genesis who found himself at one point where he built an altar at a place he called Bethel. And he called on the name of the Lord there. But as Jacob's days continued and his years grew, he became distant from God, from what he once was. He wasn't, he wasn't rebellious at this time. He wasn't running from God like Jonah was. But Jacob, even in his life, realized, I need to return to Bethel so that I could see the presence of God again. We find into the, uh, the in the New Testament is, Jesus gave the story of the prodigal son. Remember how the son was close with his father, yet left, went and spent all that he had in a far country with riotous living. The only way he had to get right with his father was to what? He had to return to the father. And this morning, my challenge is simply this. As Christians, if we are going to stand before a holy God and say that I am right with God, I must return to God. I have to return. And if I'm further than I've been before, it means there's a place for me to get closer. If, I've, if, if I'm as close as I've ever been, there's still room to get even closer. Until we see God face to face in glory, we'll never have the opportunity on this earth to say I, I'm, I'm as close as I could possibly be. We can continue to grow, continue to get right with God. This morning, just three simple thoughts from the book of Jonah, chapter two, on this praying prophet returning to God. Number one, I find the people to return. The people to return. You see in verse number one, then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. It was Jonah who was inside this fish's belly. Look at the person who was called to return. It was Jonah himself. Remember back in chapter one, we found Jonah was a prophet of God. Jonah was somebody that God had used before. Jonah was somebody that God came to and wanted to, to go see a revival in a city. Jonah was not just uh, some rebel. Jonah was not just some guy off the street. Jonah wasn't just some uh, wicked reprobate. Jonah was somebody that God knew he could use. And yet it was him who needed to return. If Jonah as a preacher and as a prophet needed to return. Can I say this? How much more do you and I need to know we are right with God? You see, often it is not the, the wicked who need to get right with God. It is the redeemed who need to get right with God. It's my people, which are called by my name, that will humble themselves, as we saw in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Understand that it's our job to get right. The person to return is the person who left. Many times, again, we're, we're quick to cast judgment on the outside world and say, well, you know, the politics and the uh, wicked people and the heathen and the pagans and the abortion crowd and the, this crowd and the wrong crowd here and the murderers and the, 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 those in the riots and the, uh, you know, hate people. All those, if they would get right with God, but the problem is they were never close to God. The people who can get right with God are the people who have a relationship with God. The truth is, this morning, my, my, my children, as dad and children, we have a relationship. 
Oh, undoubtedly, there are times that that relationship gets fractured. There are times where dad fails children. There's times when children fail dad. There's, but there's a reconciliation that says we must get right. Every marriage here in the room, you know what it is for a husband and a wife. You're, you're together. You have a relationship. But sometimes we fuss over here and we feud over this. And sometimes we split up because of this disagreement. And yet all of that means we, there's a time we must get back together. That same relationship is the same idea that we have with God. Now, he's never going to fail us, but many times we will fail him. And if you're honest with, your, with, with yourself this morning, there are times where God saves us by his grace. We're linked in him, with him. We're joint heirs together, members of his family, bought by the blood of the lamb. Praise God for all of that. But yet there are days where we, we go through and we fail him. We're not as close as we should be. We, we, we put the Bible away and we, we kind of hide it in the corner of the house and it, it never gets open. It doesn't get read and we don't bow the knee in prayer and, and maybe we start to mingle in with the things we shouldn't do and, and we start listening to the things we shouldn't and, and go in the places we shouldn't and following advice of those that we shouldn't. And, and before you know it, we're distant from God and that's when God says, I want you to return. The person to return, it was Jonah. By the way, Jonah, the one to return was this one on the run. You see, Jonah knew he was guilty. I can't look out this morning and call you out by name and point to you and say, you need to get right and you need to get right. You, I can't do that. But if you're here today, you know if you need to get right with God. I could stand here and, and, and I could fool a church and I could fool a family and I could fool friends, but I can't fool God. He knows me. He knows what I've done this week. I, I, I have nowhere to go. If there's a need to return to God this morning, you would know it. This prophet Jonah, we find the people to return. But secondly, in Jonah chapter 2, we find the place to return. The place to return. To return. Again, look at verse chapter or look at chapter one, verse 17. Let's see how this goes. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, verse 1, chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. He was inside this, this whale, inside this great fish, inside this, this, this animal there in the sea. This was the place where he had to return from. This was the place. It was a lonely place. Now, I've never been inside a fish's belly. I hope to have to experience that. I like the boy who went to school, sitting in science class, and the teacher, uh, teacher began teaching about all these, uh, you know, uh, whales and fish and dolphins and all these things in the sea. And boy raised his hand and said, oh, yeah, remember Jonah who was swallowed by a whale? That must have been some big whale. And he was trying to put things together. And the science teacher there in the public school said, no, no, son, you, you don't understand. A whale can't swallow a, a person. That's, that's impossible. That's, that's just very, that, there's no way. And the boy says, oh, no, no, I, I went to Sunday school and I learned it. And I know in the Bible, it's, he sw this whale swallowed Jonah alone alive and uh, spit him up. He was alive. And the teacher said, no, son, you're terribly mistaken. There's no possible way. Uh, you see, the, the, the whale doesn't have the right uh, uh, esophagus and the, all these scientific things. And the boy is just kind of puzzled. And he, he stomps his foot. And he says, no, no, I know it's real. In fact, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jonah how it was possible and what kind of whale it was, because obviously you don't know. And the teacher teacher was, was, was furious over that, says, now, listen, how do you know that Jonah went to heaven. Maybe he didn't even go to heaven. And the boy says, well, if he didn't, then you could ask him. And um, <laughs> at that point, we recognize Jonah was inside this. Well, some of you will get that later. Um, inside the belly of this whale was a lonely place. There was nobody else in there. It was a lonely place. And often the place where you and I must get right with God is a lonely place. You see, this is not a group effort. This is not a thing where, okay, one church here, let's all just hold hands together and let's, let's pray and let's, let's all get right. Let's all jump into the will of God together. It doesn't work that way. You see, even amongst a, a church body, even amongst other believers, if we're going to get right with God, we must do it alone. 
You'll never find in the Bible where a whole people decided we're going to we're, we're going to all of us go ahead and follow God's will. Usually it was a handful. Usually it was this group. Sometimes it was one or two. But it's a lonely place when we must get right with God. I know sometimes we're quick. Again, we can look at other people and say, yeah, if that lady, if that man, if this child, if this teenager, if they'd get right, then the church would have revival. But the truth is we must look inside and say it's a lonely place. I don't have to wait for somebody else. I don't have to check with my wife. I don't have to check with my family. If I need to get right with God, it's time for me to do it by myself. I don't have to wait for the pastor. I don't have to wait for the teacher. I can get right. This lonely place inside the belly of the whale was a place just for Jonah. If someone's keeping you from getting right with God, understand that sometimes we separate from that. and Sometimes God will bring us to a place of seclusion. I wonder how many of us have ever experienced in life God drawing us to a lonely place. Wondering, God, why, why did my friends forsake me? God, why did my family leave me? God, why did this person move? God, why did, you, why did you separate me to this lonely place? And it could be because God wants you to return. Inside this fish's belly, we find a lonely place and a quiet place. You understand that often so much distraction, so much noise around, it keeps us from actually being able to return to the Lord. Many of us are real good at creating noise in life. We have the TV on in the morning. We put the headphones on in the afternoon. We've got music playing in the car. We've got the radio on. We've got somebody around. But how many of us are good in the quiet place? You know, it might do us well, even in our society today, to find an alone and a quiet place. Nothing else going on. Sometimes we get scared when it's quiet. Sometimes the thoughts of our own mind are so loud, we're afraid to turn anything else off. And yet I guarantee if we would allow ourselves to get quiet, God can get loud. You see, the Bible tells that that's where God speaks in the still, quiet places. And inside this place was an uncomfortable place of getting right. It was dark. In fact, we read here in the scripture where the, the weeds in verse number five were wrapped around the head of Jonah. We read of how the, uh, the, the fluids inside this belly, you could imagine what that must have been like. There were death and, and destruction all around him from other things that were eaten by this way. Oh, you could imagine this very uncomfortable place of getting right. Sometimes we... We, we lament the idea of uncomfort in our lives. God's put me in something I don't like very much. And it could be because that's the place God wants you to get right. What do we do when health problems come or layoff comes or uh, uh, wrong uh, uh, schedules come? Maybe it is uncomfortable. And yet that's a place for getting right. We find it was an ordained place. This was a place God had prepared for Jonah specifically, only for him. Truth is, this morning, your place of getting right may be different from someone else's place of getting right. For some, it may be an altar here in a church. For some, it may be the place with a fellow person that you must ask forgiveness from. For some, it may be at home on your knees crying out to God. For others, it may be in your car. But it is an ordained place that God has to get right. Finally, I looked this morning at the process to return. We saw the people. This was Jonah who was on the run, the prophet of God. We saw the place inside the whale's belly, a lonely, dark, uncomfortable place. But the process to return. This is the whole message, really. How do we get right with God? If I'm living in a place like Jonah, further from God than I once was, in a place that I'm being chastened by the Lord, in a place that is uncomfortable, a place I don't want to stay. How do I get right? How do I return? How do I get the joy of my salvation back? How do I pillow my head at night knowing all is well with my soul? How do I, uh, I have that, that sweet love and favor with God Almighty and know everything is okay because he's on the throne and my heart's at ease knowing I am completely right with him. How do we do that? Here's the process. We find, first of all, we must acknowledge God's presence. 
Look at chapter 2, verse number 2. Here's what Jonah said in his prayer. And said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. We find we must acknowledge God's presence. God never is more than a prayer away. It's more than a cliche. The truth is, Jonah realizes he lifted up his voice in that dark, uncomfortable, lonely place. God heard him. And even in the depths of the whale's belly, as he calls it, in the depths of hell, God heard him. I wonder if we're willing to acknowledge God's presence in our life today. It might not be what you thought it should be. Your life may not be going the direction you were hoping it would go. But can you acknowledge God's presence? He always hears no matter how far we've run. Let's look down at verse number three. We find, first of all, the acknowledging of God's presence. But this process to return also involves accepting God's punishment. Accepting God's punishment. We find in verse number three. Jonah says, for thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the sea, the floods can pass about me, all the billows and waves passed over me. And Jonah realized, this is your judgment, God, I'm here to accept it. You see, one, one of the things that keep us from getting right is we don't want to receive the rebuke. We don't want to receive God's judgment. We don't want to receive his correction. If your child or my child were to do something against me, and I take my child aside and say, okay, now there's, there's discipline, there's, there's consequence for what happens because of what you did. And they bristle, not going to happen to me. You're not going not to get me. I'm not going to receive that correction. I'm not going to listen. I'm... Can, can I ask, are we ever going to have a restored relationship? We can't. And until you and I as Christians can receive this chastening of the Lord, that this punishment that God says, because you've done wrong, until we can accept it, we can never move on. But then we find this process of return moves to uh, anticipating God's presence. Anticipate God's presence. Look at verse number four. Here's what Jonah says. Then said I, I am cast out of thy sight. Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. <laughs> Jonah realized, I am far from where I'm supposed to be. Because I'm cast out of your sight. I'm down here in the whale's belly. I'm, I'm not even doing what you've asked me to do. I'm so far removed. I'm cast out of your sight. But I'm going to look again toward your holy temple. And what we find is Jonah doing here, anticipating God's presence as though if I look toward you, I know you're going to be there. Hey, can we claim the promise? Every time we look toward God, he is faithful to be right there. Again, draw nigh to God. He will draw nigh to you. Makes no difference how far we've gone, how far we've run, where we come from. God is there with his presence. If we will turn to him, he will turn to us. Here was Jonah. He acknowledged God's presence. He accepted God's punishment. He anticipated God's presence. But next, he, we find the awakening of God's past. Awaken God's past. Here's what Jonah says in verse number 7. Skip down in chapter 2, verse 7. As Jonah's pouring his heart out to God from the belly of the whale, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. First, he anticipated the presence by turning toward God's holy temple. Then he said, I remembered you when you were there. I'm going to awaken up the past. Hey, how do we return to God? Sometimes it, it's a trip to remembering what was before. How do we return a marriage to the sweet relationship we're on the... We're on the when they're trying to break up, they're trying to fall apart. Here's help to every couple here. Sir, ma'am, tell me about when you first fell in love. Sometimes we start going down memory's lane, and then we start reminiscing over here. Tell me about the time when you got married. 
Tell me about the dreams you had years ago. Tell me about when your children were born. Tell me about when times were sweet. Tell me about that first date. Tell me about those words, I love you. And all of a sudden, remembering where we came from in a relationship sometimes is steps toward restoring it. Same thing with you and God. We awaken the past of what God's done for us. Doesn't take long. I've told you my testimony before. I could take you back to January the 25th, 1995. I could tell you how walking down the aisle there at 355 Panama Avenue in Chico, California, where I knelt and trusted Jesus as my Savior. I could tell you about the times at camp and youth conference growing up. I could tell you about the times of bended knee. I could tell you about the services in church where I knew God's presence and I knew his sweetness and I was filled with his mercy and I recognized his grace and said, God, you're good to me. When I can remember and awaken the past, it allows this returning process to continue. And then here's what Jonah did. He answered God's petition. Look at verse number nine, please. Jonah answered God's petition. Chapter two, verse nine. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. Here's what Jonah says. I will pay that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. You see, Jonah said, I'm going to answer your petition. Whatever you want, God. Whatever you want, I will pay what I promised. I will give what you deserve. God, you've, you've done so much for me. It's my turn now to answer and to do what you've asked me to do. I wonder this morning again, is there something God has petitioned for you and I? What is it that he's drawing you to? What is it he wants you to do? You see, we can never return. We can never get right with God until we say, Lord, yes. Yes, Lord, yes. Have your will and your way in my life. Whatever God asks is when we're willing to do what God asks that we can return to him. Then finally, here's how Jonah ends in verse number 10. We find Jonah awaited for God's provision. He awaited God's provision. Verse number 10, the Lord spake unto the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. I love that verse. It's crude, it's simple to understand. It doesn't make for great uh, piety in church, but just as true as John 3, 16, here it is. Jonah gets right with God. He returns to God, says, Lord, whatever you want. And then God says, now I can use you, Jonah. And God just kind of called that fish to shore and said, come on up. Rubbed his belly a little bit, gave him a tummy ache. And that great fish, that whale vomits Jonah out onto dry land, says, okay, Jonah, your turn. You got right. You said you will return. You said you will do what I've called you to do. You've recognized you were wrong. Jonah, there's nothing between us now. Your sins are forgiven. Now go do what you're supposed to do. And God's provision will always come to the repented heart. Next week in chapter three, I'm going to preach the message, the idea of the second chance that God gives. You see, God, God, is, God is a master at recognizing you and I, we come short all the time. Whether you're saved or whether you don't know Christ, we fall short of his glory. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We, we've, we're sinners. For the wages of sin is death. We know there's a punishment for that. But yet, we don't have to die alone. We don't have to die in our own sin. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, God gave his own son so that he could pay the price of sin. And if you freely receive that and you've been saved, you know him as Savior. He's a patient, a long-suffering God. He calls us now to do something for him. Sometimes we, like Jonah, start running and going the other way. God steps in and says, now, I got to teach you something. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's not going to be great. But if you'll respond properly, if you'll return, I could use you again. This morning, as we take the idea of getting right with God, I wonder who and how God has spoken to and what it is we need to do to take a step, say, Lord, I'm, I'm not going to live like this any longer. I'm not going to run. I'm going to return. I want to get right with God. In a moment, the pianist will come, the music will play. We'll give a simple time of invitation. 
We won't take all afternoon here. It won't be a long time. But with our heads bowed this morning and our eyes closed, I'm going to begin with a word of prayer. And as we usually would, as we close our services, I'd ask you to pray with me. And maybe God's spoken to your heart today. Maybe there's something you recognize. I need to return. I need to get closer. I'm not saying you're, you're running like Jonah was. I'm not saying you're, 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 you're uh, some wicked uh, sinner this morning. But maybe there's something you just need to return to. It could be something as simple as a daily walk with God. It could be something as simple as uh, shoring up uh, uh, the way that I'm living. It could be asking forgiveness from somebody else. It could be committing to uh, be honest before God and man this week. Whatever it is, may God work in our hearts. The music will play this morning. Our heads are bowed. Our Heavenly Father, we do bow before you. Lord, I pray that you would direct our time of invitation. Lord, as we would pray and call on your name, I ask that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, draw us to yourself. Lord, if there is anything preventing us from being as close as we've ever been before, I pray that we would remove that today and that we would draw close to you. Their heads bowed this morning. I wonder if somebody here would say, Pastor, I need to get closer to God today. I know that. Again, I'm not calling you out saying you're backslid far away, not saying you're in the depths of despair, not swallowed by a whale. But maybe just a step today. Say, Pastor, I want to take just a step and get closer to God today. Can I pray for you all around the room? Would you be so kind? You raise your hand, put it right back down. Thank you. Thank you all around. Just want to take a step. Now, you don't have to tell me what the step is. But right now, as you pray, would you tell God, Lord, here's the step I need to take. I need to read my Bible more. God, I need to be faithful. I need to confess a sin. Lord, I need to do something to get closer. Maybe somebody today is here and says, Pastor, I don't know for sure I'm saved. I don't know Jesus is my Savior. I've never called on the name of the Lord. I don't know for sure. Heaven would be my home. If you'd be so kind, I won't call you out, won't embarrass you. But if I could pray for you this morning, say, Pastor, I needed to be saved. I need Jesus as my Savior today. Could I pray for you? You'd be so kind, just raise your hand. You can put it right back down after you do. Is there anybody like that says, I need to be saved? Let's all together today take a step and say, I'm going to get closer to God. I'm going to return. Heavenly Father, again, I thank you for this time at church. Lord, your word is so real, it's so true to us. We need it. I'm asking now that you would help us to take that step. Help us to return to you. Thank you for your word today. We pray now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You've listened well this morning. I thank you for it. And while we may be just a minute or two over from our, our typical time frame, I think it's been a great service, and I thank you for every bit of it. I'll ask our ushers to prepare one more time. We'll close our service with an offering. Again, this will be a love offering, an opportunity to bless our, our guests here, the Fry family. Maybe you came this morning and said, I wasn't prepared to give extra, and that's okay. If you're able to come back tonight, we'll take another love offering again, uh, specifically for missionaries and I wanted us to be able to opportunity to give brother Steve if you would lead us in prayer and uh, music will play after that we'll come back and dismiss our service
Amen. If you've enjoyed church today, say amen. And what a joy. The music, the preaching. Brother Fry, thank you for being here. Thank you for Sunday school. And uh, again, back tonight, 6 o'clock, choir practice, 5 o'clock. And uh, you come and be part of that. I think it'll be great. Next time, uh, another song already starting to work on. They'll be singing again here real soon. But uh, let's uh, uh, plan to enjoy the afternoon. My wife and I will be in the foyer here for a brief moment. And we'd like to shake your hand, greet you as you leave out. The Fry family, I'll let you at this time, if you would, uh, slip back to your table here. And I encourage everybody, please stop by the table, grab a prayer card, and uh, get to know these, these dear folks. And we're so thankful they're here. And uh, we look forward to being back together again. God bless. This morning, we are dismissed. Thank you.